Greetings. Hello, everyone. Hello, um, all those of you that are watching live stream TV or um, on the computer or on your phone. We just want to welcome you to our Saturday night service. Taurus and I have the privilege of breaking bread and bringing the word of God to you tonight. What an honor, right, Taurus? Amen. It's yeah. an honor to always bring sure the is. word. It is an honor. Amen. And we've got some prayer requests. I'm going to pray for Rebecca. Rebecca, I know you're watching, and um, Lori, you requested this for her. So right now, Rebecca, we speak to your body, and we command it to be healed. We command all pain and sickness and disease to go from your body. You're a daughter of Zion, and God loves you. And he wants your body to be free from pain and sickness. So, God, we release your healing power to Rebecca in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to lift up, I'm gonna lift up uh, two of our brothers, um, Scott and Roger. We're going to lift them up right now. Father, we lift up Scott and Roger. We pray, Father God, that you heal their bodies right now in Amen. Jesus' name. Lord, the attacks of the enemy has to go right now in Jesus' name. Scott's foot is healed, fast and speedy recovery right now in Jesus' name. All infection has to go. Roger's body is healed right now in Jesus' name. We plead the blood over these men, and we speak them healed right now. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, there is an urgency of the kingdom in this hour. How many of you believe that things are happening and there's a shift that's coming to our nation? It's already here. How many of you feel that in your own personal life? And you know that God drew you here months ago, that he had already started the assignment on your life to bring you closer to him, right? There's just an urgency and there's a panic and there's um, chaos throughout the world, but how many of you know that the gospel of Jesus Christ is the good news of God? You know, it's not your story, it's his story. The gospel belongs to God. It is his word to us. Amen? And for a long time, people have struggled with the inherent word of God because these scriptures were, um, if you can say, inspired by the Holy Ghost, but written through man. And a lot of people right there have a problem believing that these are the divine words of God. Mm. Listen, if you struggle in that area, you're not going to have the power released in your life because it is the power of God. The word of God, say that with me, is the power of God. Say the that. Of, the word of God is the power of God. It's the power of God. And you've got to know that the word is the power of God. You know, many people died defending this gospel. Yeah. The gospel of Jesus Christ. That's right. And man, a lot of people, I mean, they were those kind of people that truly believed that these were the words of God. How many of you have a difficult time? And I want honesty. Hey, you can say, preach it, girl, woman of God. I like y'all to talk back to me, okay? Yeah. I don't like interaction. <laughs> Amen. You ain't going to fall asleep tonight because if you are, I'm going to call you by your first name. Amen. I'm going to ask you, hey, what did I just say? And you're going to be like, oops, I don't know. Amen. Listen, how many of you struggle with, with what's in your hand right now? Anybody? Be honest. Anybody tr truly struggle with the gospel of Jesus Christ? Do you believe it is the power of God and to salvation? I mean, is this an inward knowing? Do you think that these are just man-breathed words? But no, this is the power of God. So we see the gospel's lost its um, relevancy. Taurus and I were talking about this. He goes, so what you're going to talk about? I said, well, you know, dad doesn't ever give me the heads up, but I'm going to give you the heads up. I want to talk about the gospel. Yeah. I want to talk about the good news tonight. And so I was talking to him about how, do you know that the statistics in today, do you know that um, drug addiction has climbed in the last six to seven months like you have never believed? Yeah. Do you understand that there was a poll given to our nation and they wanted to know, is church relevant today? Yes, it's do you know that over 85% of people said they'd rather eat pizza and watch a football game? Wow, it's amazing. Discrediting the work on the cross. Discrediting the honor that is due to him. Listen, it's in scripture. 
how are we supposed to even pray? Our Father, hallowed be thy name. We've lost the hallowed be thy name. How many of us have used the GD word over our lifetime, over our life? Amen. And we've, we've blasphemed the name of God. And we said GD to so many things. And we've lived our life not honoring the very way we are to even pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. There is a seriousness in today's culture. The devil is serious. He has been breaking us down for years mm -hmm. with ultra mind control, with Masonic being hidden under the stream of godliness. There has been wolves in our lives, and we don't even know it, tearing us down, bringing us down, amen, with our beliefs about God and who he is you know, and what these scriptures mean to us and what they should mean to you. You know, people are, um, are worried about what, who they're going to offend. People are worried about offending this person or that person or this type of law or this. Does anybody worry about offending God? Oh, that's Does anybody worry about offending God? Viewers online, you know, people worry about offending their boss. Yeah. They worry about offending uh, other sexes and other people's belief systems. But do you ever think about offending God? Do you think God is offended right now with the things that are going on? The, the man-made laws that, are, that are, people are, are, are exalting above his laws. Right. You know, look at our government, just American government. Look at them. They're fighting with each other over who's going to run the country and what law is going to be passed. Right. And it, worrying about who's going to vote for them. You know, if you say that you proclaim the name of Jesus, I don't believe you should be voting for anybody if they're not following those principles. I just, that's, the way I, that's the way I see that. You know, other people see different, that's their right, but I have the right to see it that way and because I'm a Christian. And I, if I want someone to lead me, I want, this says, follow me as I follow Christ. Not follow me as I follow uh, uh, um, Bill Gates or follow um, Clinton or follow Obama or follow, I don't, you know, these men, these are men, and they break laws, they break rules, <laughs> and they bend stuff. And I believe they, be, they're the ones that are going to say the GD word, you know. And, but we follow them, and thousands, millions of people follow them, you know. And this is not where God wants us to be at. So are we upsetting God? Do we worry about making him upset? Think about that. So statistically right now, we're in bad shape as a nation. Yeah. You know, um, we're just in bad shape. We're in that word turmoil, if you can say it. How many of you have ever been in bad shape just living the life, you know? You know what it's like to live in turmoil and be in turmoil. But right now as a nation, we're in turmoil. We're in bad shape. And because this, we're so anti-God and anti Christ, that the world, um, through Satan's um, devices and the structures, man-made structures, because he's the God of the cosmos. So the God of the cosmos, if you break that word down, means man-made structures. Mm -hmm. So we've got a whole bunch of self-made people and their structures, and God has come, and he's about to bring a word, and he's about to shake this nation, and all those man-made structures, guess where they're going? <clears throat> they're going to crumble to the ground. Mark my words. You know, in scripture, it says that the high and lofty places will be brought down low. Low. Oh. And we see fires and earthquakes and hurricanes hitting nations and hitting cities. Amen. And we wonder what's going on. And we wonder if God's a good God. I'm here to tell you he's a great God. He honors his word. Amen. He has a love for us that we we'll never know till we meet him in eternity. His love can't even touch the love of your mother. 
And I want you to think about how much your mother means to you. Mm. I know the man sitting next to me loved his mama. And there was no woman and no love that's going to come close to Mama D's love. But I want to tell you something, ladies. I know some of you have had those loves in your life that was the love of your life. Anybody ever said that about somebody? Yeah. That was the love of my life. life. Well, I'm here to tell you something. You are the love of God's life. Amen. He created you with purpose and direction. Amen. And with, with assignment. Okay? We just got a little off track. You know, when I was going through my divorce over e almost 11 years ago, I went through a divorce, I find myself in a very, very dark place. How many of you have ever been through a failure that makes you feel like you're just not worth anything? You know what I'm talking about, ladies, you know, men? You just went through that rough place and you found yourself at a place that you didn't want to ever go to and be in. It's not like I, my mission in life was to go to divorce court. Amen? One of the most sorriest courts on earth. When I walked into divorce court, there was 35 other people looking like me like this. <laughs> like, it was not a happy court. I've never been in court in my life. The first courtroom I went to was a divorce courtroom. Amen? Never been to court. I didn't know what to do, didn't even know how to act. But I was there with 35 other people, and it was a miserable place, um, brothers and sisters. It was a very miserable time in my life. But, you know, during those times, God speaks so loud to you. Amen. He will. He will speak so loud to you during those times. And I remember when I was at one of my lowest times, and it was just, just me feeling sorry. Nobody wanted to come to my pity party, Gabriel. Not one person. I had a pity party, and not one person wanted to come with me. Deidre, I <laughs> said, my party. God, what's this going? What, what are all these Jesus freaks? And I'm going through hell on earth right now. Why does everybody want me to be happy right now? I couldn't even get, have my pity party. I wanted the room all blacked out. I put down the sheets, turned all, I wanted to be in darkness. You know, like not darkness, but like dark, like all the lights out. I don't know if you've ever been in that moment. Maybe I'm the only person, no. but I wanted it dark. I didn't want to take a shower. I didn't want to brush my teeth. Oh. I didn't want to eat. Oh. oh, am I in the house? Has anybody ever felt like that? And in the midst of my darkness, can I get an amen from the left side? Can I get an amen from the right side? I mean, can I get a hallelujah from the angels? In one of my darkest moments, God spoke so profound to me. <laughs> Everyone's like, what, what did he, did he say? say? He's like, I mean, what he spoke say? so <laughs> profound to me. And I was saying things like, I'm not good enough. Why did he leave me? Am I ugly? You know, I thought my nose, my belly. I was like, oh, my, you know, I'm like, why did this happen to me? I'm the most perfect person in this whole world. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> and I was just feeling so bad. And God spoke these words so profound. And he said, Lisa, literally, just like I'm telling you now, before your husband left you, he left me. Wow. Oh, I got chills every time I say it because it's about honoring one another, honoring God, allowing that honor to overflow out of your life. And when he put himself with my hurt, that's my God. That's my dad. This is, that's what he said, I like. felt, and it's like when you said that, did people ever think, did I just dishonor God? By picking up this drink, by sleeping with someone that don't have my last name? Man, you can't go around sleeping with women that don't have your last name. It's called covenant women. Same thing. I got to say that, ladies, because I'll get in trouble. They'll think I'm man bashing. Why is it that we dishonor our covenants with each other? You know, the Indians and, and the gang members and people that really, truly know covenant and blood covenant, you know, it, they see the church as a joke. Yeah. They see the church as a joke because we allow substances to run our lives. A pill this big destroys families. Every day I see it. Guys, I've been around addicts my whole entire life. You have to realize this. Do you understand me? 
I'm speaking from a place of experience, not from a place of a casual looker by. I've spoke to hundreds of wives, hundreds of wives begging for God to heal their husbands and daughters and mothers and grand. How many, Brother Slim, how many families have we prayed for in that office right there? Fighting for their loved ones' lives because we've gotten so off track. How many of you have been there? We have. We've been there, haven't we? We've gotten off track. This is why the word is power unto salvation. Because the word of God, Tars, what it does, it keeps you on track. It keeps you accountable. Every time I read the word, I'm not happy about it. It's something I got to fix. It's a mirror. I'm not real happy about it every time. I'm like, oh, man, that too? I got to love my enemies? What are you talking about, Jesus? You mean I got to bake them a cake and bless them? Oh, my, I can't put a bone in the cake or something? Can I put a piece of glass in the cake, Jesus? You guys, this is mind-boggling, isn't it? You know, um, you just look around. Look at the seats. This is the eye-opener. Look at the seats. They're empty. Not all. Not all of them, but there's... What I'm saying is because there's people who choose to sit on their phones right now. I'm not saying that they're not watching online. I, I, don't, I apologize to the people online who are watching. Don't take, are watching. Me, don't take me wrong. I'm just trying to make a point is that there's other people out there that must rather watch uh, Will of Fortune right now. Or they'd rather watch some type of series on TV right now because they feel like there's nothing wrong in their life. They feel like, oh, there's nothing wrong with my family. There's nothing wrong. What it is, they don't want to admit that there's something wrong. Because, you know, when you move, travel around all over the place in this program, people online, we have a program here called My Brother's Keeper. And we, in one of our things that we do, we fundraise. And we go all over. We go into Missouri, Arkansas, Texas, uh, Kansas, all over. And we run into lots and lots of, lots of hurt, broken families. And it doesn't, it doesn't matter if they have money or if they're poor. It's there, and, and a lot of, we run across a lot of people who have turned their back on God. We run across a lot of people who don't want to proclaim, and this is what we're kind of talking about, proclaiming the word of God. There's people who refuse to proclaim Jesus, and they turn their backs. And it doesn't discriminate. I mean, look at, just turn the TV on. Look at the TV. They're having big marches all over the place, and they're, they're marching, marching for, you know, rights for people who are, for, because of the police are being brutal, killing folks and all this stuff. It's because God is not being uplifted anymore. The nation is in this condition because God is not in the forefront. Right. You know, because God says, love your enemies. Mm -hmm. So what's the problem? Right? Mm -hmm. that's, the, that's what I initially challenged you with as soon as I got, opened my mouth. Mm -hmm was do you really truly believe this word? And is this word falling on just dull ears tonight? Or is your hunger really ready to receive and house mm -hmm. the word of God? Or are you just here because you've got to, you live on property and you gotta be here, you know? Or are you here because you know that you need it because it's either life or death at this point? You know? And that's the seriousness of this message. Our first, um, we're going to go to, I believe, Romans. We're going to start with Romans. We're going to roam through Romans. Come on. Who Amen. wants to come with me on a journey, we'll on a word through. journey? Hallelujah. Start your I want to hear if you're hungry. Let me, let me, somebody shout if you're hungry for the word. Yes. All right, ladies. My goodness. You almost got me believing you. My gee, I got some, I got some of those Holy Ghost goosebumps. You know what I mean? When y'all did that. Now, you know, I know y'all like burgers, but how many of you like this word? Anybody Amen. like this word? Amen. Amen. Okay, so Romans chapter 1, verse 8. I want to read it from the screen. Amen. And highlight it. It might already be highlighted in your scriptures because this is Word of God Church. Amen. And you men and women get the Word of God taught daily to you, don't you? Okay. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. Listen. 
This is Paul, one of the greatest write, epistle writers. He was hardcore, man. This guy, he was that ride or die kind of guy. How many of you know that he took this gospel and he took it seriously? How many of you know Paul's story when he was <clears throat> thrown off of the donkey, right? The road's called the road to Damascus experience. Wow. Raise your hand if you yourself have had a road to Damascus. Let me yeah. see. Let me look. Let me see you. If you've had this experience with Christ, I mean, where he encountered you and everything about you changed the moment he encountered you. We see here in the gospel that Paul is saying to the church of Rome, this is the first century church. We're now in the 21st century. This is where we've become really rotten as a culture. The decay, you know, like a body decaying. We've become so rotten because of the influences of this world, nothing to hurt your feelings. But we've been given a, a diet of dishonor in America. Wow. A diet of disrespect. Men don't open doors anymore. Kids like my daughter um, will walk into a room. I'm talking about her age, not her, because we're training her better. Because she doesn't do that. But what happened to the age of respect when you see an old lady, you help her, when, help her with her groceries. Don't steal her purse. Do you see where we've gotten? Cut in front of her. Do you see where we've gotten? We're gunning people down. <laughs> we're, we're beating up old ladies for her purse. Do you see the decay and the rottenness of, of the soul of man? Yeah. It's a depravity that you've allowed. Tell me you love me. I need somebody to say, oh, we love you. <laughs> okay. Okay, only four. Th I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk to this side because this side's not feeling me, but I still love you, brothers. Amen. Okay. We do ourselves a dishonor, ladies, when we dishonor this word. And you rather take a word of a man. Well, why don't I say it like this? May I? Of a dog. Wow. I'm not calling men dogs. They call themselves dogs. The culture has declined. And they're like, what's up, dog? You know what you're telling me? You're a dog. That's what you're telling me. Hey, is anybody mad at me? You shouldn't be because that's the culture. Girls come up. What's up? My. Oh, no, I'm nobody's. I'm your sister. Wow. We don't do that around here. Amen. Around here, we don't call you by your last name like prison or number. What's up, O2? I don't know what they do in prison. I'm just making you. You, you, you probably know more about that. I do. I, I don't know what they do in the pods and all that, but this pod, we're going to stand up in allegiance to one another because you're my covenant brother. That's right. Oh, y'all don't want to have church. Y'all want to be silly. Amen. You're my covenant sister. You're not standing in allegiance for me because I've done something to you, for you. I didn't die on this cross. See, now when I get off the chair, it's preach time, right? Because I, you, I don't demand you to stand allegiance of me. I, I, I command an allegiance because of our sisterhood, because of the blood that we share. It's Christ's blood. I haven't done nothing to you. Nobody in this place should have beef from, with me. Amen? <laughs> I haven't done nothing to you. Amen? You know who done something to you? You've done it to yourself. It's because of how you think and your filter and your messed up mind. Because you know why? Because we've been rotten. Mm. Do you love me still? I, I need to, a drive-by smile like my dad. We've been rotten. We've been given a daily diet of dishonor, distrust, disloyalty. We can't even trust anybody. Some of you come in here, you can't even trust. You see Slim giving Tara some money, you thinking, ooh, banana bread money. Where do you get that? Where do, you, where do we get, you know where we get that from? The rottenness of our soul. I know I'm in the house. I'm not, I know I'm not, I know what I'm talking about. It's corruption. Straight corruption. Ladies, I know it's going to take you a minute to trust me, but when you do, I'll become one of those women in, in your life that I will be there for you no matter what. 
It'll take a minute for them to trust me because they don't trust anybody because they've been hurt and used and abused. Some of you men have a problem with women because you've never had a woman that was faithful to you. I understand that. That's real to me. Some of y'all going over there, getting the miles on her car, seeing where she's going, and now you got GPS. Some of y'all with some really good time investigators, amen? You investigate your women, and I understand you got to because she's been a really rotten girl, woman to you. You know? She's been really rotten. I understand why you have to act like that. Listen, I got a machete under my bed for any time he messes up. I'm playing. I'm messing. <laughs> I'm just playing. I'm not playing. You know what I mean? But listen, Paul said to the church of Rome, let's reel it back, reel it back. To the church of Rome, he says, your faith is what? Man, y'all was asleep. Y'all was asleep. What did I just read? Your faith is known where? All over the world. Throughout the whole world. Can they say that about your faith today? Can people say that about the church today? Does the church, do we even sound like Jesus? Has the church lost its power, lost its re relevancy? Help me with the word. Relevancy. These millennials, these 20-year-olds, guys, we've lost them. We have lost them. They sit back and look, and they don't know what to believe. They don't even know who they are. That's how rotten and messed up their soul has become. They don't even know if they're female or male anymore. It's, you know what, there's a new trend. I went through a gothic stage, okay, guys? Honestly, I did. It was a little bit of a gothic stage, rocker chick stage, okay? I loved the punk rock, but I couldn't do it too much because I was the church, you know? My dad kept me, you know? He was my Moses. Now, if I was paying my own rent, I could do whatever I wanted to do, but I wasn't paying my own rent, okay? So my father said, these are the boundaries. You're not going to wear that, Lisa, black lipstick. and black. Anyway, we had to talk and everything what was going to be accepted in the house. But I went through my different stages. Do you know that there's a new stage right now, and it's called being fluid or transgender, or like you can just go to the other side. There's just this new trend amongst the, our young millennials. Did you all know that? Yeah, it's out there. They don't know who they are. He's stolen identity from them. He's stolen purpose from them. And Taurus and I, I worked for over 27 years with youth. You guys know this. I know exactly what they're seeing and what they're feeling right now. And I always tell them, I said, we can't, we don't ever get in a debate about it. We just go to certain scriptures. It's there, black and white. I ask them to read it. I don't even want to say it. So there won't be any. You read it. This is what it says. Man shall not. And so they read it. I let them say, this is God speaking. Now you do what you want to do. I can't force anybody to, be, anybody to live a certain lifestyle. Like, can y'all do that? Can we lead a horse to water and make them drink? No. We present the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. We say, here, this is the standard. This is the holy standard. And we say, can you do it? No. You need Jesus to do it. Yes. Do you want him in your life? Yes. Yeah. Boom, there it is, transformation. We can't do it. We just present it. And let me tell you guys, we're doing a lousy job presenting the gospel. The church has become irrelevant. The church is empty, like Tara said. What's going on? It's not the gospel. The gospel hasn't lost its power. People are not proclaiming it. We're not proclaiming the gospel. And the young people, this generation, are looking at a whole bunch of fakes. They got, a, they got a joint in their hand. They got a beer in their hand. And they're trying to bring the gospel. They can't even have victory over a pill this big. How are you going to tell me how to help me with my life if you, I can't even trust you with my pill, with my medicine cabinet? You know, um, like they're proclaiming pornography. They're complaining. This is what's been proclaimed. Look at on the billboards. People online, you know, we're talking to you as well because even though we have people here that are in the program, we're talking to you as well because you may know people, not just addicted, but they may have, be, may have problems with, 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 with anger, you know. I've been 
they may have a problem with working all the time and their, their work has taken over it has taken the front seat over their family they may have problems with with you know they may have problems with cheating in their marriage man or woman yeah. look what's been proclaimed on the billboards marijuana beer um, you, they have all kind of stuff on TV that you see that's been proclaiming and I'm gonna read a definition about proclaiming and, and definitions here to proclaim means to declare publicly to declare publicly you can smoke weed to declare publicly you can walk drive by and see a, a, a stripper bar with the big sign proclaiming come in come in come in if you like you see I'm trying to make laws proclaiming these laws and we're going to legalize prostitution all over the world we're going to legalize this Proclaiming it publicly. And it also says to declare proudly. Oh. If you don't know what the word declare means, declare means to make known formally, officially, and explicitly. They do it, they do it good. <laughs> they, explicit. They're going to make you know this. Yeah. And you're going to like it. Uh. And then they have. And you're going to like it. Yeah, instantly. Declare insistently. Mm -hmm. To declare defiantly. They don't care what you're talking about. We're going to declare it defiantly. We're going to break rules. We're going to, man, we don't care what you believe. Right. As a Christian, right. this is what it is. Mm -hmm. This is what it is. Well, so my 20-year-old son was showing me some things in Amsterdam mm -hmm. in different nations and uh -huh. different, like I didn't know would be going on in these places. Mm -hmm. But they want to mimic all this, um, begin to, they want to uh, make uh, prostitution um, our future um, President Camilla wants to legalize prostitution, but she's changing the word. She no longer wants to say prostitution. She wants them to be called sex workers, wow. which I think that's demoralizing. That's even like worse to me. Like, why am I going to vote for you? I mean, it's just a real Jezebel type of spirit upon this lady that she wants to bring this into America. And she wants to demoralize women. And people think she's trying not to. But I, I, I see the wolf tactic, you know. Yeah. You've got to learn that. You've got to be, um, this starts with a P, perceptive of people's intentions. You know, the Bible says that the spirit of truth lives where? Where is he? The Holy Spirit. He's the spirit of truth. So when untruth stands before you, guess what? Ask Holy Spirit. He's the spirit of truth. This okay? Word. He's the spirit of truth. The scripture here in Romans, you know, if y'all read down in Romans, what she was saying more earlier about how they're, they have the new gender thing and the new uh, standard of what people are new doing, fad, the yeah. new fad or whatever you want to call it. Yep. Um, it says here <coughs> in Romans, 20 um, verse, I mean, it's in First Romans, verses 21, and I'm going to read down, and it, I'm reading out of the ESV, <clears throat> and it says, for although they knew God, they did not honor him, honor him as God, or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened, and it says, claiming to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the immortal, immortal God for images resembling mortal men man and birds and animals and creepy things therefore god gave them up to in gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity mm. to dishonoring of their bodies among themselves because they exchanged the truth about god for a lie and worship to serve worship and serve the creature rather than the creator who blessed who is blessed forever amen then it goes on it says for this reason god gave them up to dishonorable passions for they for their women exchange natural relations for those that are uh, contrary to nature and the men likewise gave up nat natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another men committing shameless acts with men and receiving themselves the due penalty for their error and this is in romans this is not an old testament and so i'm i'm it's, that's not me saying that no. what, I, what we're saying is being that the word is not being proclaimed, you see these things coming into existence today. 
in when I said earlier, I said, we worry about what we say. We worry about offending people, people, man. But we don't worry about offending God. You know, God said this. They, well, they say, well, the, uh, Paul wrote that or this person. God used that man to write this. God used his mouth to write things. It's like he's using us to proclaim the gospel. He's using each and every one of us in here to proclaim the gospel. It never stopped with these men. These men never stopped. If you read through Acts, man, they would get ran off from places. And they weren't just going to any place. They were going into the synagogues. And they were proclaiming the gospel, proclaiming Jesus. Right. So I want to say this. Yes. Um, going in the same stream that Taurus is in. So he's speaking to Rome, mm -hmm. the church at Rome. This is Paul, first century yeah. church. And the minute Paul had his Damascus, ex Damascus experience, the scriptures said that he immediately he went into the synagogues. And he's like, what's up? Why didn't you tell me? Why did you leave me to my folly? I was fighting for the wrong side. I was murdering and killing. And when the light came in, he was a changed man. He had so much suffering and so much he had to endure because of who he was. It's basically like, just think of the worst Lord, criminal Lord, tyrant drug dealer who dismembers bodies coming to Christ. He had to break down all those thoughts about him that people didn't even, tr they were afraid of Paul. He was a bad dude. He would snatch people out of their homes and burn them at the stakes. Do you understand? Yeah. So when he had this God moment and was blind for three days, the Bible says that he went to the synagogue. And that's basically going to the governments of, of culture. And he stood in the face of culture. And he looked culture in its face and said, why did you lie to me? Mm. Wow. And we've got to look this world, this devil, this serpent. He's so ancient, guys. He's been around a long time. We got to look in his face. We've got to look at the world for what it stands for. It is contrary to God. It is enmity to God. The world is not our friend. And we've got to get in the face of culture. And you grab it like this, like the T-shirt grab. I call it, excuse me, with all honor and respect, like this. You know what I mean? That kind of stuff. Ladies, and you take back your life. You take back your life. And you stand in the face of culture because exactly what Taurus just read. They were given over to their own lust, to their own folly. That's why... That's why one of my favorite bands of all time, Journey, they had a beetle. It's because it's back in this where they were worshiping beast and creepy, creepy things and the beetles and the bubble and bumblebees and all these things, the Illuminati, it, they're all really sacredly placed in our life and we become desensitized to it, guys. But it's demonic. It's worship. It's idol worship. And we just sit back and don't even, oh, well, that's, you know, you know. I, this is my favorite group of all time. Your favorite group of all time are Satan worshipers. Do you understand? I'm going to proclaim it to you. If you don't want to hear it, it's not my fault. Keep listening to their music and see what's going to happen to your life. Okay? Because you know what? Most people, most people, when they get in those places, mentally, things, if it's not an uplifting place to be, you're going to do some demonic things. And that kind of music just helps propel. It's uh, called state of mind. Here's a, someone just uh, sent me a message. They said, and they sent this, and I thank them for it. It says, you know, they're no longer choosing male or female on the birth certificates. Oh, yeah. Parents want the child to make their own choices then they come, when they come of age. Make their own choices if they're male or female. This is, this is, this is, think, think about this mentality, how the world is being dumbed down. They're proclaiming, they're proclaiming this and saying, no, no, don't proclaim the word. They don't want your child 
to talk about God in school. However, they're giving them the right to choose their gender when they come of age. But this is the same child that can't get a driver's license until they're a certain age. <laughs> or they can't go into a bar when they're a certain age. Or they can't do certain things until they're a certain age. But you can choose your gender. Not to get on that topic and just wear it out, but this is the world we live in. When you can shut schools down and leave a liquor store open. Right. So, so back to <laughs> something basketball, Wayne, some guy named Wayne, his son is not even 12, already making those appropriate things and changing his body. How many of you know what happens when this basketball player, Dwayne, I don't even know what his name is, has a son. It's a real famous hot topic issue, okay? What happens when he's 24 and he wants to have a child? What happens when all his little fad, it ran out, and he wants to be a man again? But because his parents allowed a 12-year-old, 12 12-year-olds 12 can't make decisions for their, for their future like that? Who, who thinks they can? Be honest. You're going to let a 10-year-old. No, you're not. You're going to lead them in the path of God. You're going to do your best. The Bible says, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he grows old, he's not going to depart mm. from that. But we are having babies being born, and their names are X, Y, Z. That's how they're naming their children. They won't even name the child. And this is the big Tesla guy who owns, who's the wealthiest man in the world right now. Oh, no. His wife, a super weird lady, big time, um, and she had a baby, and they named it X, Y, and Z. And that's ridiculous. And this is our culture, guys. This is where we're living, okay? This is the America that we're living in. All right. I want to go to this. Um, do you have the other scripture that we found together? Yeah, it was um, Luke. Let's go to Luke, guys, in your Bibles. Luke chapter, um, chapter 14. So the word of God is the good news of God. It is, the, it is God, the one who holds the, our breath. Do you believe that he gives us breath? Anybody in here? Amen. He gives us breath. The good news is not a chance thing. You don't try Jesus like some of you men and women tried, you know, certain things. Amen. In your life, you don't try Jesus. You, you know, you do Jesus. It's, it's a done deal. You don't give Jesus a try. That's so inconsiderate. So selfish of you to say, I'm going to try Jesus. Mm. It's crazy. Y'all will try all these other things. You're going to bungee jump. Y'all want to jump out of airplanes. Y'all want to live on the edge. A lot of you men. Uh, how, well, there's women. women. There's women that like, what do you call them? Not thrill seekers, but the other extreme. word. Extreme. Yeah, they're extreme, uh, extreme people. You know, they, they want to live on the edge type of people. But it's funny how when it comes to the things of God, we're so... Ooh, I don't know about that. What do you mean you don't? What do you mean you don't know about that? I'm telling you of a, of a man who emptied himself, died on the cross, took so many lashes on his back, a pierce on his side. He had thorns. What don't you know? What is? How is this hard? Well, a lot of people don't want to give up. They say the freedom and to live their life. Right, and here that's the whole point. <laughs> we have our own will. It's nobody's twisting your hand to do this. It will be the best decision you will ever make. I want to tell everybody that tonight. It will be the best decision you will ever make. How many people now, are beat down in the world? You might not ever get to drink another keg of beer again, but hey, it's okay. You might never get to, oh, Jesus, do I dare say it, amen? But it's okay because it's an eternal reward, guys. There's an eternal reward for this. Living on the straight and the narrow, amen? I know you're wild and y'all are crazy and I'm looking at a whole bunch of, I'm looking at a whole bunch of survivors and y'all are, man, you ride or die women. I hear it. I hear it all the time. I don't understand it though because I know I wouldn't take a case for a man and go to jail for you, baby. I don't think I would. But I know there's some crazy woman that would and have. Just speaking by experience, ladies, that's pretty intense to me that somebody would take a case and then for you. Boy, it's quiet in this house right now. 
I'm telling you, you have the best. If you have Jesus, you've got the best ride or die person in your life. I guarantee it. He will take you places that those people only would t make you dream about. Luke 14. What, what was the verse, ladies, did I say? Six. Did we say a verse? Not yet. Okay. We don't want to tell you, like Pastor Felix said, I want to tell you because then you're going to start reading it. And my phone and our technology, it shuts down on us. What, what, what is it? Here, let me go. Let, let me get it since. It's 26. Okay, we're going to go to Luke 14, chapter 20, verse, no, chapter 14, verse 26. I will read it up there. On this, I'm a King James kind of girl. I do study, though, with Amplified and ESV, but I like to bring it with New King James. Amen? It says, if any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and his wife, <laughs> you, okay, look, everybody look at me for a second. This is hardcore stuff. This is crazy. All right. And children and brethren and sisters, yay, comma, and his own life also, he can't be my disciple. Paul was so intense. When he found the truth, he never once looked back. We never hear in scripture about him relapsing. We never hear in scripture about him backsliding. We never hear in scripture about him being confused ever again. To the end, he did his assignment and he did it well. He overcomes so many obstacles of people talking about him, saying, can we trust this guy? He overcame all those things that each and every one of you and me have had to do in our life if we've ever dishonored somebody. How, how many of you know that's going to take a couple of months for them to believe you again, to trust you again? It just comes with it. You know what I mean? Once we've broke, broken someone's trust, we've got to build it back up, guys. Don't expect it overnight. Don't be that kind of a person. You got it. Hey, you hurt somebody, you're going to have to, they're going to have to gain your trust again. And we see Paul fighting and going through every barrier, every obstacle to proclaim this gospel, to preach this word. <clears throat> the Bible says when he went into the synagogue, he, they, they got so mad at him because he was um, confronting culture and con in the face of culture that they wanted to kill him. How many of you have gotten in the face of the devil so bad that he wants to kill you? How are we making that much havoc? Nah, we're not. I want to make more havoc on the kingdom of darkness. I want to get in the face of culture. I want somebody to threaten my life. Okay, well, I better slow down there. Anyway, but you know what I mean? Now, listen, I'm not going to lie. And over the, over the course of my life, since I've been saved for 49 years, y'all know that, the course of my life, my, they did take my dog and kill it and sacrifice my dog. But I've had a lot more wins than losses, guys. Amen. They couldn't touch me, but they sure took my little schnauzer. Taylor, God rest your soul. I know I'm going to see you in heaven, my baby girl. They called pastor, and they called us and say, we took your dog and sacrificed it tonight. Cut the entrails out of your perrito. I was so hurt. But you know what? We didn't take two steps back, sister. We went forward harder, kicking devil's butt even harder. You know what I'm saying? You want to take my dog? Oh, no. Amen. That's about all. That's about all. I've had a lot more wins than losses. Amen. And I don't plan on losing anymore. Amen. We're going to get in the face of this, guys, and we're going to speak to it, and we're going to command it, and we're going to make it. Amen. Go back. The Bible says, man, you're going to tread upon serpents. You're going to stomp. The devil is under your feet. Let me hear some stomps real quick. Let me hear it. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. It's a few stops. Man, ladies, you girls are on point right now. Something's on fire. Man, you're a little slow, but that's okay. I love you. But my girls, they really, they're devil stompers, Taurus. Amen. Man, y'all are tired of it, aren't you? You know, we got to get to that place that we are sick and tired of being sick and tired. You know, this man came in six years ago to my brother's keeper. I saw him walk in the door. Actually, I spoke to him on the phone. And I go to him on the phone, like I tell everybody, 
If I've ever done your intake, normally it's Mama Muse because she's the pillar of this answering the phones and being in the front lines for us. We love you, Mama Muse, so much. She's the voice of my brother's keeper. I've always said that. Every one of you pretty much spoken to her before you walked through these doors. And I honor that woman so much and what she's done for this ministry. But, you know, he walked in this, um, I talked to him on the phone, like I tell everybody, are you ready for life change? That's my, that's all, that's what I ask you. Are you ready for life change? Are you tired of being sick? Are you at your wit's end? Are you at rock bottom? And he said, yeah, I sure am. I said, really? Talk to him. I don't know, two weeks went by. Finally, he came into the program. I walked into the office because I found out he was here and he was a family member of one of our beloved families here, the Woodards. And he was kin to them, and that's where the connection was. So I walked in, seeing who this guy was, never met him in my life, walked in, and I looked at him, and they're interrogating him, <laughs> like only like Big John and Pastor T can do back in there. It was more like an interrogation. We still love you guys. But they asked him something, and, it, and I love his story because I, I listen to my dad's story, and I always love to I love the stories of who and how and when, how y'all came to Christ. The stories don't ever change because it's the way it was. And they said, are we going to have a problem out of you? Are we going to have a problem out of you? That's how they talked to him. Yeah, wow. I'm like, man, they sure were not nice. Are we going to have a problem out of you? And he looked up, and he says, you're not going to have a problem out of me. This is the kind of stuff I live for. It just brings tears to my eyes. When that full surrender, and when you really are sick and weary of the world. Because it's rotten. The world was rotten to Taurus. Rotten. I can remember the dark moment. I was like, you know, uh, uh, there were several of them, but I can remember that one moment where... You know, the, the, I was in I was in a really, really dark place, and I was in my room, and, and, and I love the story the pastor talks about when he's saying that he was in the middle of doing drugs, and, and he told everybody, you know, I'm not going to be doing this one anymore. Day, yeah, one day. And I was, I was in my room, and I got these people in here, and I'm sitting there, and I got a needle in my hand, and I, you know, I, I got to that point where I couldn't even hit myself anymore. I couldn't even hit myself anymore. And, it, and, and I told everyone in the room, yeah, and I just didn't have, I didn't have it in me. And I was like, you know, I'm not going to be doing this anymore. I'm not going to do this anymore. This is not me anymore. And they're all looking at me like, well, let me get your, let me get your shot then. Let me have it. You know, and I'm like, I'm like, here, you can have it. That's a vulture. You know, but I was in a dark place. And then later on that night, man, I, I was looking in the mirror and I was looking at myself. And I had one of those, those dip bars that we have in the gym here, those, those dip bars. And I'm standing in between it, and I just broke down and started crying, man. And I started crying so hard that there was like three or four girls in there and some, a couple of guys, and they, just, they all started crying with me. And they're like, what are you crying for? I'm like, I'm just, I'm just tired. Yeah. Tired of living a life, proclaiming a life that didn't have any meaning to it. Yeah. I was tired. And, when, and, then, and then I asked God to take me out. Take me out of this life. God, please help me. Help me, Lord. Help me. I started proclaiming like it's saying publicly in front of everybody. Lord, please, God, help me. Jesus, God, whatever, help me. And, man, it wasn't not even a month later I was, called, I was calling them, talking to Lisa on the phone. And I came here, you know, and... And I was proclaiming another whole nother belief, man. I was under another banner. I, you know, I didn't claim. I, I was like Paul. I persecuted Christians. <laughs> I persecuted. I went to battle with Christians daily. You know, I wasn't trying to hear nothing about what a Christian was talking about. Nothing. Right. If you're not talking about this, I'm going to get away from me. You know, if you're not trying to convert, get away from me. Right, right. But it wasn't, it wasn't man who converted me. It was God. It was Jesus who converted Woo! me. You know, when I called out, when I called out. When I called out, he heard me. Yes, he and when I came in here, and then what's, what's so amazing is that when I came here, I, I had a Quran. I came in here with a Quran and everything. I didn't even know it was packed in my bag because I didn't pack all my stuff. You know, my mom and my sister, they all packed my stuff. They were ready to get rid of me. <laughs> so 
when they got in and they were in there packing, it just so happened the one luggage that I had in there had that in it. And Tommy, Tommy, Pastor T, <laughs> and, Big John. and Big John, Pastor T was looking at me, and, T and Big John was over there searching. He goes, ooh, ooh, Tommy, look what we got. And he hands it to Tommy, and Tommy was, and it had a book cover on it and everything. And Tommy goes, that's a nice book cover. He opened it up. He goes, he said, brother, we don't have a problem out of you. We, we don't do this here. This is, we, 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 we preach the gospel. We preach. And I'm like, and I'm just sitting there looking at him. And I, it can't, I said, no, sir, we're not going to have any problems. And then what, what, what was amazing, what was amazing is that I seen what I seen in these men. I seen uh, these are street guys, but there's something working in these guys. There's, so there's a power, a power working in these men that I, I want this. I want this, and I'm willing to do whatever it takes to get it. I don't care what anybody says to me and what they got to say. I want that. And then the Lord showed me his power. When they prayed for me, I came in this place. I was jacked up high. Man, I was so high, man, it was pitiful. I couldn't even sit still. I was, you know, if anybody's ever did math, you know, people, you can turn your whole body around and still have your <laughs> face looking straight, you know. Wow. Uh, really? <laughs> yeah. You know. And I'm moving around and moving. And, and when they prayed for me, I walked across that street you sober. Got, you, you got to know what you're talking about over <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I walked across that street they sober. Really and the lady that was with me, which is my ex-wife who brought me here, the power was so strong, that dunamis power, Ooh. not any power, but the dunamis. dunamis power and authority in Jesus Christ in his name. Woo. When that name was spoken in that circle, the lady, darkness had to flee she released our hands and ran Aww. said i don't want no part of what's in that whatever that is i don't want none of that she ran out and i was like i want and i grabbed their hands i said i want it and man and, and and i walked across the street i was sober i was sober and from that day i woke god woke me up at four o'clock in the morning every single day for that whole year or so every day i woke up at four boom and I, I, don't, I woke up before, and I would go in, and I would read the Word and study the Word and read the Word and study the Word every morning because I love Jesus. And see, look, she, this is what she's talking about, how the world don't want you to do this. The world don't want anyone to experience the power of Jesus Christ in your life. They want to shut it down. They want you to experience the power of, of spirit that's in the bottle. The power of a spirit that's in a, a little 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 pe pipe. a little peel, or the power power of a spirit that's in a meth pipe, or a crack pipe, or a heroin needle, or whatever other new drug they got out there. Right. They want you to experience all of these things, wax. wax or whatever that is. I don't know what that is. So I want to say this: <laughs> we are a testimony of God's yeah. covenant faithfulness. Write that down and tell your neighbor that too. And that's what Taurus, this, his testimony, that to me was a covenant faithfulness. We are testimonies of God's covenant faithfulness. We are testimonies of God's covenant faithfulness. Powerful. And those of you later, I will be having more time with you guys so you can know a little bit more about my story. Um, but never being a part or serving this world. Um, we, my father told me this one time. He's like, Lisa, the difference between you and I, and I've never heard it was so profound. He said, is I am the power of God's power of deliverance. I am an example of God's power, deliverance, power. But he goes, but you, Miha, which means you, daughter, are a power of God. You are God's sustaining power. Amen. So we each have a testimony. And our testimony, it's God's covenant faithfulness, covenant with us. He has been so faithful. We all have different stories. We've come from different walks of life. But you've got to realize today that you are God's faithfulness, covenant faithfulness, okay? That's, you're an example of God's covenant faithfulness. Because there, he doesn't break covenant, guys. We do. Every time we settle for something less than, we break covenant. Amen? 
You know the Dad, um, Dad said something Sunday. He created a new word. I love it. He's like, we're missers. Missed. We missed it. I We're missers. That. I'm like, wow, that's a new thing. And I've been saying that all week now. Sure. You're a misser. You know, it's not, I mean, it's not a nice word, but, but, but hey, we've been missers. How many of you want to start getting some, like, you know, stop being missers? Anybody in here? I mean, let's at least shoot for the bull, the, the, what is it called? The bullseye. Okay. We might not all get, but at least we shot for it. We went for it. You got to keep until when? Until we get it. Until we get it. Amen? We don't stop in the middle of it. I don't see any of y'all in here ever in an operation room getting up. Okay, I'm, do I'm done with this operation. And you just get up and walk off of the operation table? You would be insane if you did that. Um. You're either the an anesthesia woke up, uh, wore off and you got out of the operating table? That's insane. Don't leave. Don't leave. Stay the course. Stay the 12 months and some. Amen. We didn't get in the shape that we're in in 12 months. We got there in 12 years. We, it was a lifetime of, of some rottenness, right? So how many of you know the importance of staying the course? You know, you got people. people. And enduring to the. Okay, baby, go ahead. I'm, I'm just, go you know, ahead. I'm going to participate. Go ahead, participate. No, I was joking. Um, I'm just saying, you, you got people who leave the church, the 21st century church. They leave the church because they, wanna, they want it to be a certain way. Oh, yeah. They don't want the gospel to be spoken and teached in the church. They want cookies yeah. and Kool-Aid, and they want coffee and donuts. And Pe people like us, people like us are sitting out here. We need the gospel. We need it. We need the gospel. We don't need, any, we don't need something that's padded. We, need, we don't need something that's watered down. You know, and, and here, right here in Luke 10, right here in Luke 10, um, verses, verse, uh, where is that? Verse 19, 17 through 19, it, it says, I'm going to go, I'm going to read this, it, going from 18. And, and Jesus said, he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. And behold, and behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the powers of the enemy, nothing shall hurt you. Nothing shall hurt you. This is what we have to learn. We have to learn this. And you go into a watered down place, you're not going to learn that. You're not going to learn how to step on serpents and scorpions. <laughs> you know, what's a serpent and scorpion? Go out there in the world and see. And get stung. Get bitten by whatever it may be. There's a lot of things that can sting you. A lot of things that can bite you and strike you. People come at you like snakes. Right. People come at you like scorpions. You know, this is where we're at. We have to be strong. The Lord is looking for strong soldiers. He's looking for people who are willing to allow the word to be planted inside of them. Not, not someone that wants the word to just sit, rest on them. He wants it to rest inside of you, you know, so that you can be good soldiers um, because we need it. I, me personally, I don't ever want to go back to where I came from. I don't know about anyone else. I don't want to come back. There's people online that's watching. You know, they might be saying, well, you know, I, I've never done drugs. Yeah, but what have you done? What do you need help with? You know, what do you need help with? The world can't help you. Oh, some psychiatrists, yeah, they can talk to you. Right. But to a certain point. But when it comes to that inner thing that you need, that spiritual thing, you got to have Jesus. You got to have Jesus. In order, that's the best doctor you can have. I feel like when I'm looking out mm -hmm. at every one of us today, that God's covenant faithfulness, he does not break covenant with his people. He will see us through any plague, any pestilence, any turmoil, whatever you're going through, mm -hmm. whatever your rock bottom looks like. He has spoken a word over your life. Young man, there's a word spoken over you before you were even born. God said that he predestined you. Before you even breathed your first breath, he spoke a word over your life. You know, each and every one of us, that's the discovery. That's the journey. Because Satan knows what's been spoken, and he knows the impact that your life will have, and he's thrown distractions and detours your whole life. Because he knows the impact 
of who you are and why you were created to walk earth. You know, not everybody has breath today. Not everybody has purpose today. But those of you who shouldn't be alive and still here, I look at you guys as something special. God kept, kept you alive for purpose. There's a fulfillment in God that needs to become a reality in you. God needs to be your everything. Okay? Before you leave here tonight, you need to work that out. Got to work it out. He can't be secondary. He will never be secondary. You have to put him in first. If he's not in your first, then there's an issue, and we have a major issue. Okay? There's a compromising. The mission's been compromised. I'm trying to wake you up. I said there's been a compromise. <coughs> you know, the spirit of compromise runs rampant through our young children because they compromise. They give in to peer pressure, and they compromise and they, it, with their beliefs because of peer pressure, and they're called compromising Christians. Wow. And we just fall into peer pressure. Well, everybody's doing it. So... That spirit of compromise in Jesus' name must be broken <coughs> off of us, okay? Because the mission has been compromised. Several of you in here today have to get back to reality, okay? Your trust shouldn't be in him or her, ladies, men. I'm talking to my brother's keeper and all of you on the airways. You can't put your trust in your whole entire into one person. You're, that's giving that person way too much power over you. Number one, you should not do that. Your trust has to be put in God. It's got to be centered. There's, there's a song that goes, Jesus, you're the center of my joy. Something like that. All that comes from you. So he's got to be the center. It's all about balance, if you will. If you could just see it in the spirit realm right now, a balance coming to your life. I speak it forth right now to each and every one of you. Amen. A balance, a center. He's got to be core. Some of you are breathing that in right now. I just saw you, and the, you're receiving that. Balance. You've got to make a shift, a supernatural shift inside your heart right now. Put that girl, put that job, put that opportunity down here. Make it secondary. Put him center. When he becomes center, all, everything falls into play. He will not leave you. He will not forsake you. Ladies, he will give you your heart's desire. But you have to seek first the kingdom, right? Yeah. So back to Paul. So he finds himself in this place. We're talking about Paul, one of the greatest greatest proclamations of the gospel. This man was not afraid. He wasn't afraid to stand up for God, to stand up. Once he knew that he was persecuting Christians, once he knew he was working on the wrong side, there was a shift that came into his life. He was enlightened by God. He was knocked off of a horse. He was blind for three days, and the Bible gave him an assignment. You're going to go to this house. You're going to go to that man's house, I forgot what his name was, Ananias. Ananias. Yeah, you're going to go to Ananias' house. He, your, your encounter, it comes with directions, with assignments. Just like, he, just like the Spirit told Pastor, call Pastor Melba, get her. You can go to Houston. Boom, 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 boom. And he did it, right? We read this scripture in Luke, did we not? Those who don't forsake, let's go back to that real quick. Pastor, this is, we wanted to stay in the line of pastor and his teachings and what he's been proclaiming to us as a church. He's been saying it so loud, like he's sounding the trumpet. I don't know if we're hearing the importance of us surrendering completely to God and making him center, making him the number one in our lives. Everybody else is going to have to take second place, right? So let's read that. Let's go. I think it was Luke 14, maybe 20. 26. Let's go to Luke 14, 26, and we're going to wrap this up. We'll probably be done right at 8 o'clock, just because how many of you know we've got a church tomorrow, too? Amen? 
All right, it says, if any man come to me and hate not his father, I want you to hear the words that is being spoken here. Okay, now how many of you know that hate is a strong word? I tell my daughter, she's like, I hate. I said, and this is the only reason I say this because my mom would tell me this. Miha, hate's a strong word. So, you know, we use it so carelessly. So it becomes so um, common to us to use those words like love. I love cheeseburgers. I love pizza. And then when people tell us, they, it's become just a, just a word to say. You know what I mean? So he says, if any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, his, even his own life. See, coming to Christ is, is there's a death that takes place. Our will has to die. No, nobody wants to hear these kind of messages. It's a hard message. And that's why in Scripture they said, that's a hard saying. Will you say that with me? That's, that's a, a hard, hard saying. saying. Well, guess what? These are sayings of your Lord and Savior. Amen? This isn't just something to take up space in Scripture. These were prolific words sent for us today. Amen? Because he knew that there was going to be distractions to come and take the place of him. You've got to fall in love with Jesus. He needs to become the core of your life so you can be able to conquer anything that comes against you, anything that will try to pull you back into those places that you do not need to go anymore. I love pastors teaching about three years about going back to your hometowns. Just really important to take note of this. If you come from a hometown that they know you and you did a lot of damage there and they did a lot of damage to you, they're called stomping grounds. These are my old stomping grounds. You know what I mean? Okay, those places you might want to stay clear of maybe for three years according to some of the teachings in the scripture. It's always about three years. Just to build yourself up, get strength, and it's very important, amen? Because um, your life depends on it. Not just your life, but the life of your children, the life of your lineage, the people who are counting on you, people that see you as their rocks. See, the church has become so irrelevant because the power, we've lost its power because nobody's putting Christ first anymore. Nobody's really taking this gospel and proclaiming it like we should. We'd rather go to Tinseltown or a picture show or spend time with this or that. There has been so many sacrifices made for Pastor Philip to raise this place up in his life. He had to say no to a lot of things, guys. We had a lot of, you know, canceled trips, canceled vacations, different things, just so, you know, God's word could be manifested in our life. You know, we had to say a lot of no. There, there was some yeses, too. Don't get me wrong. But this is an army, and it's not like playtime it's serious everybody in this place it's serious and we feel this urgency in each and every one I would be lying and doing you a dishonor if I just came up here with a little play-doh type of message and tell you you know God's gonna make all your dreams come true you know Sorry, I don't want to you. you know what I, you, see I, I talked to my daughter before church and we have Suri or what is she called Alexa and I told my daughter Turn her off because I have been having this reoccurring um, nightmare that she's cussing me out. Like she starts to cuss me out. My daughter's like, that is so weird because she, she'll talk to you, Alexa. So I'm going to wrap it up with this. And, of course, we'll get Taurus's input. This is what I want to tell you. So Jesus, um, he makes this statement. And it's a hard statement. And he's like, you can't be my disciple if you put all this other stuff before me. You're not worthy of me. He's basically saying, you're not worthy of me. And so he makes this big proclamation. And it, Jesus is like, during this first century church, he was the master of church shrinkage. Because how many of you know he lost so many people that day? And they're like, we can't do this. I don't know the actual, um, maybe of Slim or... Um, Felix, Pastor Felix can let us know how many he lost that day. But one by one, they started walking off and saying, this dude is crazy. What is he talking about? Hate my mother? 
and hate my own life? You've got to be kidding. I don't need this. Taurus, give me the phone so I can call somebody to come pick me up. I don't need this. This is not the gospel. And he lost a lot of people that day. And you know the story because pastor has been teaching it so powerfully. And he looks at his disciples and he says, so what do you say? Are you guys going to leave me too? How many of you read this in scripture and you remember this, what I'm saying? Anybody know this? Anybody read it before? Nobody read it before. Raise your hand if you've read the scripture. We just read it, so how do you not know what we're saying? Okay. And his disciples look at him and say, no, master, we're not going to leave you. And this is what I want to get to. And this is the topic of everything in the title of this message. Anybody know what the disciples told them, told Jesus? He said, where would we go? And I want to tell you this tonight. When is God going to stop being an option for you and be your reality and be that person in your life, that Christ, that Lord, that Savior, that you will say, where would I go? Because I don't know about you. I'm in it because I don't know where I would go. Because first off, I don't know where I would be if it was with, for without, without Jesus. I don't know where I would be if he didn't show up in my life when he did. And I say this to him tonight with all honesty, God, where would I go? So I accept the call tonight. I accept the call to righteousness. I accept the call to letting my will die. And another great passage that Paul says, if I can only have a, a glimpse, if I can only just get a piece of what got apprehended in my heart. That's the, that's the prize, is Jesus. He is the prize. I don't know what else to tell you other than what we're all aiming for is him. It's the gospel of Jesus. It is the power of God unto salvation. So tonight, as we're sitting here, you need to know that there is no other option as of today. And I hope that each and every one of you from the bottom of my heart can hear exactly what the Spirit of God is trying to say to us tonight. That there is an urgency that we are real tonight, that we make this real, that it's not just the motion. We're not in here for motions and for the court and to make ourselves look better to our wives or to our husbands or to DHS. Because I want you to, everybody look at me. I want you to know that you are enough right now. I don't care what DHS says about you. I don't care what the courts say about you. You are enough. Ladies, you're enough. And it's not because of anything we've done. It's not our righteousness. It's his. It's nothing that we could have ever done. He has put our lives back together after a million pieces. We were shattered. We were broken on the floor. I mean, Humpty Dumpty didn't have a chance. You know, we was tore up from the floor up, beat down. I love what Tara said. He was so tired. He was so tired. So I just love these disciples sticking by Jesus and saying, where would we go? After you've met him, he's encountered you. Like, you, where else do you want to go? It's like me saying to Taurus, yo, hey, you know, I think I'm done. How would that look, and how would that feel like? No, I encountered, I encount, in, encountered his love, and everybody else was, was <coughs> um, they have no chance is what I'm saying. So maybe if we can love like that and love Jesus like that, nothing else will have a chance either. Amen.
because we're not going to break covenant, amen, with Jesus ever again. We're going to do our best, amen? Oh, it's my turn. No. Um, um, I just like that. I was just looking at that part where you had wrote down that um, they said they're not going anywhere. You know, you got to ask yourself, you got to implant this inside of yourself that you're not going anywhere because where are you going to go? After you experience the, like she's saying, the love of Jesus in your life and the, the miracles that's taking place inside of you in, in your very presence, miracles is taking place. I mean, your families are coming back. People online, you know, you might be praying for a job and boom, you get this job or things are taking place in your life that you can't, you can't even understand. And you know, you're like, well, it wasn't taking place until I took this leap. Right. And now all of a sudden, now that I'm allowing this seed to be planted inside of me, the fruit of this seed is starting to mature. And now look at what's going on. Why would you want to leave that, you know, and go back to the world? Because the world, it has seeds too, but it's not the seed that you want. It's not the seed that you want. It's a bad seed. You know, it'll look good for a little while, but if you look, what do you have left that the world gave you? You know, what do you have left? People who have been beat down and drugged through the mud, what do you have left? Well, you might have a person out there and say, oh, I got a mansion, I got all this. Yeah, but what did you give up inside of you to get that? Right. Not saying that everybody that has all this stuff don't serve God. That's not what we're saying. That's not what, we're saying. what I'm saying is, don't leave God for that. For that. That's right. Don't leave God for the world. Don't, do, Don't it. do it. You know, men and women in the program, brothers and brothers down in the Yazoo, Yazoo City, sorry, <laughs> Yazoo City, Nicaragua. Don't leave. Don't leave Jesus for the world. It has nothing there for you. The devil, that's his world. And he's waiting on those to fall off so he can devour you, so he can tear you apart. Listen, we've been to two funerals in the past two months, of three months, of people, of people who've been lied to by the devil, and they took their own life. Two. Well, of the few, but one got, actually, I'm going to say took his own life because he, had made, he made a choice. He made a choice, and someone took it. Another one took his life. They should still be here right now, but the devil lied to him, man. You know, so don't leave Jesus, man. Those disciples, those disciples, just think about it. I'm looking at it like this. These guys were thugs, man. They were, you know, people who just, all kind of people. We had a couple of doctors in there, a couple of rich guys hanging out. <laughs> You know, that wanted to hang out in the hood. You know, those guys, that from the, they come from the rich side and come hang out in the hood. That's who these guys were. And all of a sudden, <laughs> they, they start following Jesus. And then they start seeing these miracles and things start happening in their life. And all of a sudden, they see all these other people fall off because Jesus said something harsh. And then he turns around and looks at you and say, Stephen, are you going to leave me too? Brandon, are you going to leave me? Kent, are you going to leave me? Where would I go? Then you look at yourself and you're like, uh, where am I going to go? Taurus, are you going to leave me? No. <laughs> I'm not going anywhere. You know, and I, that's a choice I have to make. Every day. Her sustaining, her sustaining for, for however many years, 40, 40 what? 49. 49 years. She had to continue to ask herself, are you, am, where, I'm staying. I'm staying. 49 years, I'm staying. You have to tell yourself this every day, man. Every day. I am staying. I'm not going anywhere. You know, the interpretation of Paul through the epistles, um, we see a uh, metamorphosis or it morphs. That word morph in Paul's writings it, it morphs from the gospel of the kingdom. I'm going to leave you with this. This is profound if you can get it. It morphs from the gospel of the kingdom. Are you ready for it? To the gospel of the king. Amen. 
so it is the power of God. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the power of God unto salvation. This metamorphosis that took place in Paul's interpretation, especially in his writings, you see the importance and how much he loved God and how his lifestyle and everything, I don't even think he was married, to be honest. There are some speculations that he was divorced, but he just went for it all the way. He didn't have all these little extra baggages and interruptions. You know, Paul's the one that said, it's better to be single. I'm going to be honest. Because he said that in, I believe, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, something around, it's in the Corinthians. And he said, it's, sometimes it's better to be single because girls, we can be a little bit of a handful, you know? And Paul's like, man, I don't want, I just want you, Jesus. So I was single for 30 years. So I kind of know about just being that single-minded for Jesus all the way. That's what helped me, guys, get to our, these 49 years. Because if I had any interruptions, it, there would be some delays in my life. So remember that an, an interruption is just a delay, okay? So if we want to get somewhere current and fast, you got to cut off the delays and you've got to make your life on purpose and your decisions purposeful and you want to serve God on purpose, okay? This, is, this isn't chance. The word of God is not a novelty. We've really, we've really disgraced the cross and the blood and we've really taken this so lightly and um, it is a huge commitment and covenant that you're making with God so bow your heads with me your hearts father we just come before you tonight and we just thank you for number one the reality of who you are and just as Tara said this culture wants to feed us a whole bunch of other junk and they want to give us so many idols and so much other things to get satisfaction from but your word says that in your presence there is fullness of joy and pleasures forevermore. God, I just thank you. I thank you for who you are to me and who you are to everybody in this place right now. Every heart is so different. Every heart is at such different levels. And God, but I just ask that you draw us closer. Just, just a man, as a man fishing and reeling in that fish, God, I thank you that you are reeling us in by your spirit right now, God, that you've got a hook on us. You've got a hook on me. And you're not letting me go. And right where you're sitting, make that vow to him that you don't want him to let go. That you don't want to be unhooked. God, that you, as you reel us in, just kind of picture like that, that TV show, The Big Catch, and how they handle those fishes and those waves and these expert fishermen. And God, I just thank you that you've got us on, on your line. We are on your line. You're reeling us in, and we've been captured by you, God. The greatest moment was the moment that you gave your lives to God. The most powerful miracle was your life being handed over to God. So if that's you tonight and you want to rededicate your life, it's just a simple act of repentance. Actually, we didn't even get into that, Taurus. We forgot about the repentance part. So, Father, we ask for forgiveness. If this is you and you just want to get your heart right, we ask that you come in into our hearts, God, and we ask for forgiveness for everything in every place where we dishonored you, where we didn't put you first. God, just show us. Let's just begin to just talk to us and lead us. It says, Lord, in your word that your, that your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto our paths. God, just continue to shed your light and your love on our, in, in our lives. And we just receive you tonight as Lord and Savior. You know, if that's you tonight, just begin to tell him just how important he is to you, how much he means to you, how you don't take the salvation lightly. And God, we know that you're a purposeful God and you've created purpose for each and every heart tonight. 
and we give you all the honor. We thank you for our pastors. We thank you that you're strengthening them, that you're healing them. We thank you for this ministry, for this church, that it's growing, that people's lives are being changed and transformed, Lord. Let us be that those voices, Father, for this end time harvest. We want to be those voices, God, for your kingdom. Give us boldness so we can proclaim your word. And we give you all honor, all glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. 801. Yay. <laughs> God bless you. We love you. We'll see you tomorrow morning at 1030.